and, and all uh, Bruno. Uh, still? Uh, Kiev, are you ready? Uh, good afternoon, Kiev and Brussels, and good morning in uh, Washington. Jonathan, yeah, we hear you well. Good, good. Um, I think we're going to start. Um, it's it's a little after nine o'clock in Washington, so we have uh, people trickling in because uh, it's quite early, uh, and it's also tough to get around Washington at this time of the day. So, uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning and good afternoon. I want to welcome um, our speakers, participators, moderators, uh, Washington, Kiev, Brussels. Um, and those, we, ha we know we have uh, many people joining as well um, across Europe um, and Canada as well um, that are also participating, but probably uh, watching via video. So um, thank you for all of those who are joining. We have a really packed agenda, um, and uh, so I'll try to move as quickly as I can uh, through uh, just my opening. Uh, and uh, for many of you know, my name is Jonathan Katz. I'm a senior fellow at GMF in Washington, D.C. I'm one of the co-founders of the Transatlantic Task Force on Elections and Civil Society in Ukraine. Uh, focus on the upcoming, uh, this task force has been focused on, on the Ukrainian presidential election and parliamentary elections, which we still don't know for certain whether they'll take place on the 21st or not. But also, we've been focused on uh, Kiev's foreign policy priorities and objectives, uh, but also those of, uh, of Ukraine's partners uh, in the transatlantic community, uh, as well as some of the other deeper challenges, regional challenges, including Russia. Uh, coupled with that are the domestic issues uh, for Ukraine. And obviously, over the last several months, there's been a significant change. Uh, President Zelensky has been in office for a little over a month now. Uh, as I mentioned before, the potential for a parliamentary election in July, uh, which still has to uh, be firmed up or denied by the courts, uh, but it's something that we are all watching very carefully. Uh, before going further, I want to do one quick thing. Uh, to put together these, uh, these task force events, and this is our sixth um, since last October, um, we have a lot of partners, and I just want to recognize the U.S.-Ukraine Foundation, Friends of Ukraine Network, uh, Reanimation Package of Reforms, Ukraine Crisis Media Center, um, and also the Ukrainian World Congress, which has been a real stalwart of support um, over the last several months. So I just want to thank everyone for uh, for their support in putting this together. So today at this at this discussion at, at this session of the task force, uh, we'll, be, uh, we'll have representatives from the U.S. government, from the EU. Uh, Ukrainian uh, Ukrainian government, civil society, diplomatic community, Ukraine, really focused today on Ukraine's foreign policy priorities, and especially important given the changes that have taken place in Ukraine um, over the last month and will take place over the next several months. So we welcome hearing from, um, from all of the participants today, um, many of whom have had an opportunity already uh, to meet with President Zelensky and his team. I did want to point out that uh, over the last few days, there's been some new news related to uh, the U.S. side. Ambassador Bill Taylor, former Ambassador to Ukraine Bill Taylor, has been uh, uh, asked to go out to be the U.S. Charge of Affairs in Ukraine, which I think is, I think we universally in Washington think is an excellent choice. I don't think there's been anybody in Washington over over the last decade plus that has been more supportive of U.S. Ukraine relations. And, US, uh, and Ukraine's vocation in transatlantic uh, institutions and support for Ukraine's sovereignty, territorial integrity, um, and willingness to choose its own future. And so I think this is really a very positive step forward with uh, Ambassador Taylor going out. And uh, I just wanted to mention that, too, because I think it's important in the context of this discussion when one asks about how the U.S. is viewing uh, Ukraine and U.S.-Ukraine relations. We have the State Department here, a representative, who can speak to that. But from an outsider's perspective, uh, you see the U.S. really stepping up its engagement uh, with Ukraine, and I think this is incredibly positive. Um, for many of us here, uh, President Zelensky's uh, election um, and the unknown factor uh, has dominated part of the conversation here. 
And I think over the last month, we've really seen uh, some of the cloud lift in terms of his foreign policy priorities going forward uh, and whether or not he would be moving Ukraine in the direction of, of Euro-Atlantic institutions uh, and uh, what he would be doing with respect to Russia. Uh, and so over that period, I, I already mentioned the dissolved parliament, an election set for July 21st, if courts concur. Uh, on foreign policy, President Zelensky has, has had significant continuity, is reaffirm Ukraine's goals of full uh, integration in European and Euro-Atlantic institutions. He's already traveled to Brussels, Berlin, and Paris to meet with uh, Merkel, Macron, EU and NATO leaders. Uh, Mr. Zelensky will host an EU Ukraine summit yeah, on July 8th. And we understand that the White House has invited President Zelensky to come to Washington. In addition to, the, to these meetings and upcoming meetings, we've seen him make a number of positive choices to serve in key national security roles. Um, and I will say this, that I think on that, on one hand, those picks have been incredibly positive including his pick for a uh, foreign minister um, and on the national security team. Uh, on the other hand, I think there are some concerns about some of the more domestic focus picks, including his chief of staff, which I'm sure others will want to comment on. Um, and the other aspect, too, is the issue of Ukraine's uh, loans from the International Monetary Fund, which I'm sure will come up today as well. Uh, I think it's incredibly important that uh, President Zelensky is, is, in effect, dismissed uh, some of the suggestions by Mr. Klamoyski regarding defaulting on loans. And I think as someone who worked on U.S. Uh, uh, loan guarantees with Ukraine, how important it is for Ukraine to uh, keep to its international obligations, particularly monetary obligations, and how important that is to Ukraine's economic stability. So I thought that was positive. Undoubtedly, the issue of Russia remains the biggest foreign policy immediate challenge uh, for Mr. Zelensky and for whoever comes in next in the Ukrainian parliament. And of course, this is uh, front and center, uh, not only for Ukraine, but for its partners. And it was, I think, very positive to see uh, Chancellor Merkel reaffirm commitment uh, to, to sanctions with respect to Russia. And so if, if Mr. Zelensky is out there talking to European and American partners about sanctions, um, he's doing a good job and making sure uh, those uh, those sanctions remain in place. Finally, I just want to add a wild card to the discussion today, uh, which is the upcoming G20 Osaka meeting, where I think even this morning, President Trump said that he would be meeting uh, with, uh, with Mr. Putin in Osaka. Uh, clearly, you know, for all of us who have who have watched uh, the the previous meetings take place in Helsinki. I think it's incredibly important before the uh, president uh, meets with Mr. Putin that, uh, that he remains clear about support for Ukraine, uh, Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty, which I'm sure will be discussed. Uh, I have no doubt that this administration, uh, which has been there, has been very clear about its position, will maintain that position. Uh, but uh, Ukraine is not an uh, an potential trade on, on issues. And I think it's quite clear that Mr. Zelensky has said that he'd be willing and open to having uh, discussions uh, uh, with counterparts in Russia regarding the resolution of conflict in the East. And so um, I think there's, there's, you know, what that means, what that looks like, under what format, who's involved. Um, there's far uh, smarter people who are involved in this, thinking about this. Uh, but I think from around this table and elsewhere, we all want to see a resolution uh, to uh, what's taking place this conflict, but also to Crimea as well. Uh, and of course, Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty is 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 uh, is sacrosanct, and it's something that uh, the international community, many in the international community, have stepped up to support and should continue to do so. So again. I want to thank everyone for being here today uh, and joining us for this conversation. We're planning a seventh meeting of the task force in July. Uh, we don't know yet about the election. Maybe others can fill us in on the, on the latest in Kiev. Uh, but we will certainly have a pre-election uh, uh, task force event that will focus on the parliamentary elections in, in July. If I could turn it over to my, my colleague, Boris, who's uh, co-chair um, of the task force, and then I'm going to send
Так. Of course, a lot will depend on elections never take place and what the government will emerge in the coming months. And there's considerable speculation, which we've all heard and read about, about what political force will predominate in the implementation of, uh, of the Rwanda election domestic and foreign policy. And with the new president and Rwanda and government, it's also a time of opportunity. Unfortunately, I think, as we all know, earlier opportunities in independent Ukraine's short history of a time's been squandered or at least not come to full fruition. So let's hope that the current political transformation provides fresh opportunities for you to fully realize its, its incredible potential. We look forward to hearing our speakers on the challenges Ukraine faces in navigating this period of dynamic change and how the U.S., EU, and other international partners can best engage to help Ukraine strengthen security, economy, democracy, rule of law, to further encourage Ukraine's integration into the Euro-Atlantic nations. That turn it back to you, John. Great. Boris, thank you. Uh, uh, Vassil, could, could you uh, do us a favor of introducing um, your speakers, uh, Olga, Olena, and Svetoslav? Um, and again, thank you for thank you to all of them for joining us today, uh, participating. Uh, thank you very much, Jonathan. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Vasil Babic. I'm head of international relations in RPR, Coalition Reanimation Package of Reforms. Um, I want to say thank you, our colleagues uh, in studio in Washington. So. The um, German Marshall Fund of the United States, U.S. Ukraine Foundation, and Ukraine World Congress, with the help of whom we have uh, today and uh, five times before such discussions uh, on different topics of Ukrainian reforms, elections, and the way forward. Right after after what's what's happening now, very dynamic uh, events presidential elections, parliamentary elections, and hopefully um, and probably the new new government and possibly the new foreign policy, right? We are going to speak today about the foreign policy. Uh, just a very short notice from my side. Um, and to uh, update our colleagues in Brussels and Washington, what we we now have, and what we observed, we have um, observed the first steps of the President Zelensky and his administration, in particular in foreign policy. Everybody has uh, watched, and it's very symbolic, the first uh, diplomatic visit or foreign visit of Ukraine's president was not to Moscow, not to Warsaw, to Tokyo or whatever, but to Brussels to NATO and to the European Union headquarters first. That's very important. And another two uh, foreign visits were firstly to uh, Ukraine's partners in the, two partners in the Normandy format, uh, to uh, France and to Germany, right? That's, that's also, these symbolic things tell us um, a lot of things about uh, what could um, be going on in uh, further months and even years. And my um, and colleagues on the left side and the right side will talk about it uh, later. Uh, secondly, on uh, parliamentary elections, 
Uh, although we do not have any inf information about the official decision of the Constitutional Court, but uh, there are some uh, source leaks that uh, might tell that the uh, elections, the, the Constitutional Court uh, decision might be in favor of uh, constitution uh, of uh, elections on july 21st but let us um, comment and talk about this just after the uh, official decision of the constitutional court will be published right and the third and i also want to encourage the speakers today in kiev uh, brussels and washington studio is to consider for us that ukraine is steadily in international relations um, taking place between at least three actors. So it's European Union, it's US and Russia. And I hope uh, today we'll have uh, uh, some ideas and uh, fruitful discussion on how Ukraine, what's, what is the, the interest of all these actors and Ukraine as well in all this triangle, right? Or, uh, you know, um, and how could we move forward with the new new president, his priorities, and possibly uh, with the new parliament and government? How, what will or will not change uh, from Ukraine's perspective and Ukraine's interest? At this point, I would like to. Um, uh, say a few words about speakers here in Kiev studio. So welcome Olha Stefanishina, who is the general director of uh, Gam government office for European and Euro-Atlantic integration, leading it for the last uh, three years, right? And I hope she will uh, stay in office and move forward uh, this EU and NATO integration path of Ukraine. Welcome, Olga. On um, the left hand from me is also Svetoslav Yurash, who actually uh, was a foreign policy advisor to the presidential candidate, Volodymyr Zelensky, and now he leads the uh, foreign policy coordination in the political party Servant of the People. Uh, welcome, Svetoslav. And also today with us, Olena Halushka, who is uh, leading international, or who is leading international uh, department in Anti-Corruption Action Center. At this point, I would like to address the first, if I'm Jonathan, should we start with the Kiev studio or you want to start with the Washington? We're gonna we're gonna start with Washington, but what I wanted to do, thank you for those introductions, but also your your both the observations that you provided, um, which I think are inter, you know really important for the conversation. But I wanted to to turn it over to Brussels to to my colleague Bruno just to do the quick introduction um, of uh, participants there. Bruno, can I send it over to you? Hey, Jonathan, and uh, good afternoon, Kev, as well. Pleasure to be uh, part of this event once again. Um, we actually have a, a very honorable speaker amidst us today, and as you see, the event is once again well attended in Brussels, a uh, full round table. But um, we uh, had the pleasure to welcome a representative of the European External Action Service, Richard Tibbles, widely uh, known and famous for his expertise and experience working on the region. He is currently the uh, head of the Eastern Partnership uh, Bilateral Relations at the European Union External Action Service. So. Uh, thank you, Richard, for being uh, with us. Really pleasure to have you. Thank you. Great. Bruno, th Bruno <laughs> thank you. So uh, I just in terms of sort of order, uh, we're going to start first in, in Washington, uh, and then we'll turn it over to Kiev and then uh, and then to Brussels, if that works for everybody. And uh, I, if I could just introduce, we also uh, like uh, you, Bruno, like the colleague you just mentioned in, uh, in Brussels, we really have um, one of the uh, real leaders on sort of U.S. policy making in, uh, in Ukraine, but also uh, in Eastern Europe as well, uh, Brad Frieden, who's here uh, from the State Department. He is the director of the Office of Eastern European Affairs at the State Department. And also say that you've held a number of uh, diplomatic and senior diplomatic posts across Europe. So I think you bring both the perspective of of someone who's had leadership in this, uh, both in, in Europe, transatlantic relations, but also Ukraine uh, during a particularly 
a challenging time and transformative time. Um, and, and even over the last week uh, as well, uh, we've even seen changes on one of uh, Ukraine's borders in Moldova, uh, which is also changed, changing the landscape. And one thing about Eastern Europe, Ukraine, Moldova, and elsewhere, if you, you, you no one could have thought 10 years ago that it would look quite like it looks like today. And, uh, and those challenges. So what I wanted to do first was turn to Brad. And when I, I spoke to him before coming here, uh, we uh, exchanged some emails and I really was hopeful that we would talk about U.S. engagement with uh, Ukraine uh, because it takes uh, two to tango. Uh, and sometimes in the multilateral world, it's, it's uh, many people to tango. But in this case, uh, Ukraine has been such a priority uh, issue and U.S.-Ukraine relations have been a priority issue. Uh, for for a number of administrations, um, this one included, um, and uh, and there's been such substantial changes internally in Ukraine, um, and will take place over the next couple of months. Uh, maybe just to touch on and talk about some of U.S. priorities with respect to Ukraine. I also mentioned uh, that there's been I, I don't know dates, but I've seen I, I know it's out there publicly about a an invitation. President Zelensky, you don't have to confirm or deny, or if you can confirm, that would be great. But um, obviously, the White House and the administration um, has done a lot to reach out to uh, to, to the new uh, to the new president. Um, but also because of the challenges and also the sensitivities of what's taking place, um, really is prioritize engagement. So if I could turn it over to you, and also just deeply appreciative that you could take time. Uh, I know how busy your schedule is to be with us today. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jonathan, for that very nice introduction. Uh, good morning to everybody here in Washington, and good afternoon to my friends in Brussels. Um, excuse me. Oh, it's on. Good morning to everybody in uh, in Washington, and uh, good afternoon to everyone in Kiev and Brussels. Um, I'll say a few words uh, about uh, how the U.S. sees Ukraine right now, and uh, hopefully that will uh, lead to some good discussion following uh, the, the remarks. Um, I'll try to keep it short and uh, so we can have plenty of time for, for discussion. Um, obviously, Ukraine's in the midst of a, of a historic uh, political transformation. Um, Zelensky's victory by 73 uh, percent of the vote um, really shook the foundations of, uh, of Ukrainian uh, uh, political society. And uh, the upcoming parliamentary elections, whether they take place uh, this month or um, or in the fall, and I would be interested to hear from our, our colleagues what, what the what the odds are on both of those outcomes, uh, on either of those outcomes. Um, that's going to lead to even more change, uh, and it will allow uh, President Zelensky to, to consolidate his power and. Um, continue uh, pushing forward with the, with the reform agenda because as you, as you all know the president um, only has powers really uh, directly in uh, foreign policy and defense so he needs a uh, he needs a government he needs a reform minded parliament to really push forward on uh, on his his agenda um, despite all the this historic change in, in Ukraine, I would say that U.S. policy uh, remains unchanged. Um, we're committed to the success of, of a prosperous, uh, democratic, free, and secure Ukraine. Uh, we, are, we stand united with Ukraine as it uh, defends its sovereignty and territorial integrity against Russian aggression. Um, President Trump made the U.S. position clear when he called President Zelensky uh, to congratulate him on his his victory, um, noting that uh, the the U.S. support for Ukraine uh, was unwavering, um, and adding that uh, uh, the Ukrainian people and and the incoming administration urging them to to implement reforms that strengthen democracy, increase prosperity, and, and root out corruption. Um, I want to talk about uh, briefly about two very closely related uh, things, Russian aggression and domestic reform in Ukraine. We see these as two sides of the same coin. Um, the, uh, you know, our work in the State Department every 
day is uh, is affected is is driven by Russia's ongoing aggression against Ukraine uh, in Crimea, in Donbas, in the Sea of Azov, uh, and in the Black Sea. Russia has undermined regional stability. It has flagrantly disregarded international norms. It has created Europe's largest humanitarian crisis in a generation, and it has violated human rights on a systematic basis. Um, we believe that um, that Ukraine's uh, sovereignty and, and territorial integrity is um, is sacrosanct. Uh, we'll never, we will never recognize uh, Russia's purported annexation of Ukrainian territory, uh, and we will never accept anything less than the full restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity. We remain committed to the Minsk agreements as a way forward in eastern Ukraine. Uh, we believe that the solution to uh, to the um, uh, crisis in, in eastern Ukraine is a diplomatic one. Um, unfortunately, though, Russia is not engaging seriously. It's been a year since uh, since uh, Mr. Surkov has agreed to meet with the special representative for Ukraine negotiations, Kurt Volker. Um, so we question whether they are really serious about reaching a uh, resolution um, of, of the conflict. They're still fueling a, a hot war. This is not a frozen conflict by any means. People are dying every day. In Donbass, uh, more than 13,000 people have been killed in the conflict, and about 2 million Ukrainians have been displaced. Uh, as, as part of the effort to strengthen Ukraine's security, the United States has provided about $1.5 billion in security assistance to help Ukraine build its defense capacity, defend its territorial integrity, and deter further Russian aggression. Uh, we're, we are heartened by the fact that President Zelensky has uh, reiterated his commitment to peace and to the Minsk agreements. Um, he is seeking to, to ease the suffering of the people in Donbass, and he has some innovative uh, proposals and plans for reaching out to, to um, for lack of a better term, to win the hearts and minds of uh, Ukrainians in, uh, in areas that are under Russian control. Um, this, in, in my view, is um, a very important step and, and a necessary one um, to, in, if we're going to under, if Ukraine is going to undermine um, the Russian control of these parts of Donbass. We uh, will support Ukraine and work closely with the new president on his diplomatic initiatives. Um, Russia must uh, implement its commitments under the Minsk agreements, beginning with a comprehensive ceasefire and withdrawal of heavy weapons from the line of contact. Uh, switching gears to to the to the reform agenda, which is we believe is closely related, um, the. Uh, lost my place here. Um, <laughs> so, uh, President Zelensky's commitment to moving forward with reforms uh, is critical uh, if Ukraine is going to continue its uh, Western trajectory. And we don't believe that Ukraine will be successful in the long term or be able to resist Russian pressure uh, if it does not strengthen its own democratic institutions and combat corruption. He, uh, Ukraine's made progress in the last five years. There's no denying that. Um, advancing the reforms in the banking, health, education, and energy. Um, but as we all know, there's still much work to be done. And corruption remains one of the most significant uh, obstacles to Ukraine achieving its Western aspirations. Building capable, trustworthy Ukrainian institutions that strengthen the rule of law, reduce corruption, 
increase government accountability and create jobs and attract investment is the surest path to economic growth, resilience, and independence in the face of external pressure. That's why we say that, that the reform agenda and the countering Russian aggression are two sides of, of the same coin. Um, on, the, um, on the economic side, uh, I would just say that, um, that Ukraine's economy has stabilized since Russian aggression pushed it to the brink in, in 2014, and a lot of the credit for that goes to the central bank and the uh, finance ministry for their, um, for their shrewd policies. The, uh, we all know Ukraine's a country with, with incredible uh, economic potential. It has a highly educated workforce. Uh, it has rich agricultural land, um, immense natural resources, and you know, business and foreign investors should be competing to get into Ukraine. Um, but, but as we know, the investment climate is hindered uh, by lack of confidence in institutions. And, uh, you know, while Ukraine's GDP has been growing at a, at a, um, at a healthy rate, um, direct foreign investment is only 2% of GDP, which is, which is minuscule in, uh, you know, relative to other, others in the region. And um, we all know the reasons why this is the case. Let me just say, um, uh, with regard, Jonathan mentioned the IMF. Um, it, Ukraine needs to um, negotiate a new program with the IMF. That's probably the strongest signal that, that Ukraine can send to investors that it's committed to, to economic reforms. Um, and uh, we expect that any agreement will uh, include measures for spurring economic growth and, and combating corruption. Uh, in uh, just finally in the energy sector, um, Ukraine does have the potential to be self-sufficient in energy, um, but it needs investment, uh, particularly upstream oil and gas uh, uh, exploration investment. And it needs to create the institutions that will attract that kind of, of foreign investment. Um, including making sure that the tendering process for oil and gas exploration is transparent and so that it will attract um, the range of energy companies that can help uh, Ukraine reach its potential in this sector. Um, Ukraine also needs to ratif ratify and implement the plan for unbundling the gas transit operator from the rest of uh, NAFTA gas. Um, and uh, we're watching very closely and working very closely with Ukraine um, to try to ensure the continuity of gas supply this winter um, when, as we all know, the, the contract with Gazprom will run out, uh, will expire on, on January 1st. Um, just in, the, in closing, I just want to say um, how important we believe it is that the United States and our European partners and Ukraine all work together on this agenda of, of combating Russian aggression and promoting um, domestic reform. This is not something that, that uh, Ukraine can do alone. It's not something that, that we can do for Ukraine. But I think uh, working together, um, the US, Europe, and, and Ukraine are a very powerful force uh, for good in, in Ukraine. Brad, thank you for that for that sort of comprehensive and I, uh, overview of, of U.S. policy um, and priorities in Ukraine. Um, and I think you just highlighted sort of this uh, really, I think, strong, you know, continued strong support in a number of sectors and areas, both foreign policy. And I appreciate and I think the conversation, I'm sure when we turn it over to Kiev, we sort of recognize is that Ukraine's strength over the long term, even in, in terms of its ability to uh, to address uh, Russian aggression or withstand pressure relies heavily on on strength in democracy, rule of law, um, on economic uh, the ability to strengthen its economy, to do the things that it needs to do domestically to uh, to strengthen itself internally, including on energy security. And I also want to just thank the uh, you know so the administration has been out front talking about Nord Stream two.
Um, and I think in a very, you know, I know there's some differences of opinions uh, in Europe and some spaces in Europe, but I think the, the administration has it spot on when it comes to uh, how that could impact both Ukraine and European security, um, something that may come up in this conversation uh, today. Uh, but on the other hand, uh, ensuring that Ukraine does what it needs to do domestically to transition its own energy economy uh, over the long term is going to is going to provide the type of security uh, that you can't necessarily get uh, from from pipelines. And we've seen this uh, picture over and over again where Russia uses energy as a weapon, uh, both against Ukraine, but others in, in Europe. And it's um, unfortunately it hasn't the story hasn't changed. I'm going to turn it over to Kiev. Um, and uh, really looking forward to hearing from our speakers there. And, and again, uh, I, thank, I want to thank all of them again for, for joining. Brad, also thank you again for, for being here today. Uh, so all over to you in Kiev. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, thank you very much to Brad Frieden, who um, had a chance to join us today and share this very important uh, points, policy points from the uh, side of U.S. Department. We very much appreciate uh, U.S. Uh, support and partnership during all these years. Um, getting back to Ukrainian studio, um, I want to first address Olga Stefanishina um, with, with some remarks and the questions. So first, facts. Before the revolution of dignity, Ukraine's biggest economic partner was Russia, and now, in, after five years of Russian aggression and Ukraine's uh, other turn you know, on the democratic path, path it's European Union. Uh, secondly, on politics, uh, for the last uh, four, almost five years, we had uh, more or less free and fair democratic elections in Ukraine, which probably we, ha we haven't had any time in the recent 20 plus uh, years history, right? And um, uh, thirdly, on the uh, two more facts, um, we are going to have uh, on, uh, you know, on uh, the uh, path of Ukraine-NATO rel relations, in May 2020, Kyiv is going to host NATO parliamentary assembly. Not NATO member will host a NATO parliamentary assembly, right? And, and the fourth fact, on, uh, apparently on the 8th of July, we're going to host, um, I'm not sure Olga will tell it, will be Kiev or Brussels, the annual EU-Ukraine summit, right? So this, these are some of the facts on, on the discussion of EU-Ukraine or EU-NATO uh, relationship. I want to address Olga with the following. How do you assess the progress that Ukraine made for the recent four or up to five years on the path of European and Euro-Atlantic integration, right? Uh, and the second, what do you um, identify as the key achievements so far and key challenges that will uh, Ukraine or should Ukraine address in the next uh, um, five years. Thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you, Vasily, and thank you, Brad, for this very comprehensive uh, vision from uh, from Washington of the, of the way Ukraine develops and the upcoming plans for the uh, foreign policy priorities in these uh, upcoming five years. Um, yeah, and like by listening, Brad, I, I really wanted to bring us all back to five years ago when we were um, uh, when the revolution of dignity uh, have uh, taken the win and what we've inherited. We've inherited the 100% vertical system of management of the country, where everything were managed by one person and the clan and family, and these were the, the common words for everybody used on a daily basis. Uh, we've uh, inherited the uh, almost empty budget uh, where the the country had to pay upon its foreign obligations and also to pay all the necessary uh, social revenues to the country and um, we uh, also were 
in front of the huge demand of the whole free world, uh, requiring Ukraine to start immediately move in all the directions and all the reforms, transforming itself, transforming its economy and building the real democracy in, uh, uh, in this country in line with the best European practices. And this, is, uh, uh, this was a huge challenge. And of course, like five years after that, it is um, um, clear that uh, maybe for, for one country it is impossible to be successful at all the possible forests. And of course, uh, this is a clear fact for everybody that in course of last five years, Ukraine delivered on the reform agenda 100% uh, more than it delivered through the whole period of in, uh, its independence, because this was the huge demand of society. There was no absolutely um, any kind of risk, uh, possibility to reverse this uh, step and this is moving towards free economy and towards a movement of free world. But also, uh, it is obvious that we didn't succeed in all the forests that we were, were targeted on. And, uh, um, and uh, now when we're planning our agenda for the upcoming year, uh, five years, I can say that we've really uh, cemented a huge and a very important background for Ukraine to keep on positioning itself as a subject of foreign pol policy. Because like, it's not a secret that a country uh, should be successful in foreign policy, but if it positions itself as a subject of foreign pol policy, and, and if Ukraine uh, positions itself as a, an object of the foreign policy, there is no successful policy needed. You can just do nothing, and uh, uh, then nothing happens with your country. And uh, now when we are talking about our ambition, has to join EU and NATO and the work which has been done in course of the last five years. And uh, now when we're like hosting the Parliamentary Assembly of NATO, we're having a 21st summit between Ukraine and EU, which would be upon its content and agenda, uh, hopefully even more ambitious than the previous one. Uh, this shows uh, as a sign of a very titanic work that has been done in course of the last five years by, by the government, the president and Parliament, uh, but uh, of course, if we're talking about the challenges that we faced in five is last five years, uh, I can say that Ukraine has become the object also of uh, the global trends such as protectionism, such as populism. Ukraine has uh, oftenly been attacked by different hybrid threats and propaganda. And this also have affected all the speed and progresses on all the reforms agenda that we had in the course of daily basis. But uh, 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 what I hear from the different messages and speeches that we've heard today is that there are a lot of assumptions what would be the priorities for, for the next year and years and what would be reversible or ir irreversible. But uh, why, one thing I can say for sure that there is no chance for Ukraine to bring back itself to the situation in 2013. Uh, there is no chance to move uh, forward and to choose uh, between one or two directions, whether it's Russia or, or, or EU or uh, USA. This is something which have, we have left far away in the past. Ukraine is moving towards free economy, to towards free world, and uh, Ukraine is capable of doing it in an effective manner. What have uh, Vasily also uh, referred to is uh, that uh, only in two years' time, Ukraine have managed to completely reverse its economy and reorient it to EU market. Uh, and this is an un unprecedented case. Not, not any of the countries of the European continent, being not a member of the European Union, have shown these dynamics of bilateral trade. And I have to say that it is done even without uh, fully functioning of the free trade uh, area between Ukraine and EU. It's, it's only about preferences that we have so far only for, for a couple of years. And this dynamics is, is growing harder. But uh, also, uh, it is very important important to say that uh, all the successes on our EU and NATO agenda, they were mostly driven by Ukrainian side. Because uh, European Union is a huge organization. We have a whole, whole and very comprehensive political support in terms of uh, Ukrainian sovereignty and territorial integrity. The same goes to NATO and US bilateral cooperation. Uh, but now when we are coming to uh, 
joining the market of the European Union. It was a purely Ukrainian initiative because Ukrainian Association Agreement uh, is the most ambition, agree, ambitious agreement which has ever been signed by European Union with a third country. It's uh, uh, something between uh, a membership agreement signed between uh, European Union and Balkans, uh, but also this is the agreement at the same time having no perspective on membership for Ukraine. And uh, we said as a priority the sectoral integration with the European Union, which means that Ukraine is, will become uh, a member of EU market uh, in a specific sectors. And this uh, is a unique format invented by Ukraine and pushed by Ukraine, which was supported by European Union. We've analyzed everything which uh, were done in the course of last years. And, and I want to also pay attention, specific attention on energy sector, because uh, when we're talking about integration of Ukraine and EU energy markets, it's not only about trade, it's firstly about security. And we're having a very strong position by negotiating in a trilateral format with Russia, because actually Ukraine does not have any room for maneuver for any political negotiations on this issue and, and uh, trade with the influence with Russia, because our energy system is fully built on EU legislation so far, which is very strict, very concrete, and, and the only option to conclude a new contract with Russia is, is it, it is in case it will be based on the transparent EU rules. And I think this is uh, one of the hugest examples that we can show where European integration leads to transparency of rule and leads to to uh, a very a very transparent and clear uh, approach so and uh, it is very very important for us that the first visit uh, a visit of president was to Brussels and then to France and uh, and Germany and all the agenda which has been built and stoned in the course of last uh, three or four years it was reiterated and we hope that it will be fixed also in the declara final declaration of the upcoming summit uh, which shows that the political will is there the political understanding is there and the positive uh, option uh, of all of that is that the bureaucratic uh, institutional and legal capacity is also ensured by the government so um, I'm looking very much positive and in, into the future and uh, I think that the most important thing is that uh, on the basis which was built on the last five years in terms of European Euro Atlantic integration the all comprehensive reform agenda and the economic growth which was ensured Ukraine can uh, also prioritize prioritize our activity to, as, uh, to position itself as a leader of the whole region. And we should be uh, visioning Ukraine on a more global context. While we have a lot of challenges inside to be faced, we have a, a solid basis to deliver on the result. And we should go uh, more uh, thinking about global context and global position of Ukraine and the world. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Olga, for this uh, deep uh, um, uh, vision of uh, what's going on and where should we go further. Um, uh, Olga already mentioned that on the path of European integration, uh, for the last five years, Ukraine made a huge step forward, signing an association agreement. And then it's, it's also what uh, Ukrainians feel by uh, moving freely to the European Union countries with visa liberalization, right? And uh, the energy market as the part of economy and also uh, a security issue. But also Olga mentioned that there are lots of things to be done and what, for example, the experts of the RPR are stressing that uh, there is a very low or very uh, tiny progress in such spheres as rule of law, judiciary, fight with corruption, and um, some other spheres. Um, my question next goes to uh, Svetoslav Yurash, who actually advised um, President Zelensky when he was the candidate, and uh, possibly he uh, continues advising him and the administration on foreign policy issues, I hope, but he will tell us in details more. Further, we have uh, not only declarations from the pre uh, previous president, administ presidential administration, government, and the parliament, but we have uh, seen that they delivered its association agreement, visa liberalization, and other big wins for Ukraine. As for the moment, we 
finally had the declaration from President Zelensky, which was very um, short but very clear in Brussels that Ukraine is continuing its path to uh, become European, to EU member and NATO member. That was very important, not only for Brussels, right? Not for EU and NATO, but for internally for Ukraine's uh, society. Uh, my question is very simple. Um, what will forward after the, this declarations, right? And how or who will guarantee that it, this will be not only declarations, what, but also deeds, and the, the presidential administration will uh, deliver on that, and the, the party of the president will deliver on that. Thank you very much. Uh, hello to everyone. Basically, to answer your question bluntly, is we will pass all of the laws that are still required for the in our agreements with the EU institutions, in our association agreement with them as well. But let me start with the background. So first, on our international and foreign policy team, there are very many voices, and many of them much more senior, much more well-known, and very accomplished. And basically, the only thing we clearly agreed on was the Euro-Atlantic integration and an extreme need to continue Ukraine's destiny as a member of Euro-Atlantic community. That's first. Second, we never mentioned anything but that direction in our foreign policy. And it... Uh, it's very unfortunate to me that I hear plenty of speculation about uh, that we will think of some other path or some other choices. Now I hope with our first visits and our declarations it is very clear that what we are aiming for is Euro-Atlantic integration and realizing the destiny of Ukrainian nation that is to be a part of global Western alliances. Uh, in that regard, we absolutely need and should pursue uh, our deepest possible cooperation with European nations, first and foremost on the question of peace. As we know, we have the Minsk format in which we cooperate with France and Germany uh, to try and force Russia to stop killing our people on the battle on the front lines of eastern Ukraine and we very much wish to rejuvenate that process. Uh, that, that's why we have appointed a senior negotiator there. That's why we have visited those partners first and foremost and yes we will do everything possible to develop our cooperation with America and we will take advantage of that invitation that was presented to us. And not to mention that on the question of NATO our first appointment uh, in the administration president of former ambassador to NATO, Madim Prestaiko, as the person responsible for foreign policy and administration, as well as president has clearly said that this is his pick for the future minister of foreign affairs, should indicate that we will do everything possible to deepen our cooperation with NATO and fulfill NATO standards in Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, on the questions that were raised as well, uh, there was a question of a rule of law and all possible with that. We have a comprehensive program which we presented and that we are unraveling with ev almost every passing day to try and uh, tackle issues that the previous administration wasn't in favor of dealing with because they preferred control of the system rather than reform of it. We will try and do everything possible possible to create independent judiciary in Ukraine, therefore ensuring rule of law and uh, the demand of national partners to work with Ukraine and invest in Ukraine. Uh, on the other matters, we have the question of the, uh, the cooperation with our uh, citizens in occupied territories in the East and Crimea, and we aim to do everything possible to make them feel citizens of Ukraine that they are. We aim to create both information channels that will communicate with them both in Crimea and in the occupied East, as well as to allow them a place in both uh, educational institutions and in institutions of power, to have them represented in Ukraine and to have them feel that they are a part of Ukraine's future and that they are part of our European and Euro-Atlantic ambitions. Uh, on the question that actually was 
speculated a plenty. That is the question of the uh, our program on um, people's power, or as we as a shorthand for that is referendums and all that. We very much see referendums not as a dividing factor, but as a uniting one. These referendums were done in plenty of European and NATO states before accession to try and unite society around the question of joining those institutions. Unlike previous government, we uh, are not afraid of our people, and we will work with them, we will talk with them, we will try to convince them what we believe firmly already, that is that Euro Ukraine has a firm future in Euro Atlantic institutions. Then we will cooperate with uh, civil uh, society and with uh, the uh, civil service of Ukraine uh, to try and achieve that. Thank you very much, uh, Svetoslav, for talking not about only declarations and deeds, but about a lot of speculations and about what is happening in Ukraine. Yeah, and we very much need uh, the thing which is called reality check. And I hope that Olena will provide us with that as well. Um, that's very interesting that uh, um, presidential candidate back then, a few months ago, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, was uh, uh, one of the least candidates who were meeting with anti-corruption activists and if I'm not mistaken he even assigned or declared to support the anti-corruption anti Ukraine's agenda, right? Uh, my question to Olena is um, uh, with uh, getting back then f a few months ago from this uh, communication with uh, back then a presidential candidate and now the, the president of Ukraine. And uh, given the first steps of presidential administration, including declarations, including uh, delivering a bill on um, the issue of illicit enrichment and other steps, how do you assess uh, is uh, the president and his administration uh, on a good track? to fight corruption in Ukraine or prevent all this risk, firstly? And secondly, how do you feel for the next five years, right? We have IMF agreement um, currently and possibly in other agreements, right? We have anti-corruption agenda with all our key partners, with European Union, with US and others. Um, how? How do you, what's your assessment? How do you feel if this, uh, if y Ukraine will, and what, what, what are the key factors to make Ukraine more successful on this path than we were five years ago? Thank you. Thank you very, thank you very much, Vasil. Um, sirs, madams, it is my great pleasure to be able to participate in today's discussion. And basically, when I was invited to talk. Uh, on the panel which is called Ukraine's foreign policy priorities and I as a person who is uh, working in the anti-corruption NGO basically I realized that one of the key f Ukraine's foreign policy priorities is proper implementation of the domestic reforms because it is very hard to find another proof of Ukrainian reliability um, as a credible partner to the international partners to the foreign countries, international organizations, then fully and genuinely implement those commitments which Ukraine made to them while getting some kind of assistance like the IMF loans or macrofinancial assistance program or more tangible carrots like visa liberalization with the European Union, for example. Indeed, uh, the Revolution of Dignity set a very ambitious plan um, which was basically endorsed by the Ukrainian society. And here I would like to absolutely agree with what Olha mentioned, that I consider Ukraine not only as uh, the country which is just passing through the democratization process. I think that Ukraine has a very big potential to become a role model for the whole region and that's what scares Putin to death. And here I would like to also agree with the message which was said by Mr. Fred and that um, fighting against corruption, doing the reforms and fighting against Russian aggressions, these are two 
um, sides of the same coin because the more we succeed with the reforms, with our democratization process, the more Putin would be interested to stop us on the way. And we shouldn't allow him to do this. We should build up on our internal capacities. If we assess the last five years of Ukrainian reforms, I think that the so-called sandwich effect was very useful in pushing the reforms forward. So we had the civil society who was watchdogging and monitoring um, locally on the ground. We had international partners who set a very specific and concrete list of reforms deliverables, which they conditioned to their uh, assistance programs and, uh, um, and other forms of supporting for Ukraine. Uh, and these two forces were pressing Ukrainian authorities to do the reforms in such sensitive spheres as fighting against high-profile corruption. Uh, but here I would also like to stress that not, not only advising or you, and using the conditioning uh, conditionalities worked well, but also the very participation of the international partners in implementation of the reforms was also very helpful. And here I would like to, to remind the example of the establishment of the anti-corruption court. If we are comparing the, the results of the anti-corruption court and the results of the Supreme Court, much less dubious candidates with questionable can, uh, reputation were green-lighted to the anti-corruption court. Of course, we will be able to judge about the work of the court when it is fully operational and starts delivering verdicts, but the very composition of the judges already makes us cautiously optimistic about that. So, um, what civil society expects from the new president and the new government, which will be uh, composed by, by the new parliament, would be to protect those positive things which were already built up during the last five years, like National Anti-Corruption Bureau, electronic declaration system, electronic procurement system, Prozoro, etc., etc., a lot of progress has been made over the last five years. Also to fix the mistakes which were made, like for example, the specialized anti-corruption prosecutor's office, whose management unfortunately is violating the, the legislation. And of course, to move forward. If we talk about what are the priorities for moving forward, over the last five years, Ukraine uh, tried to establish the um, chain of the special institutions which would be addressing the, the key, the basic and the most crucial demand of the Ukrainian society, fighting against high-profile corruption. Because when Yanukovych fled the country and everybody saw Mezhihirya, luxurious residents, of course that was something which Ukrainian society demanded. However, the comprehensive rule of law is not yet established in Ukraine. Unfortunately, we are still having very often rule of money and rule of political decisions. And this should be eliminated. And as Vasily rightly mentioned, uh, President Zelensky during the campaign endorsed the anti-corruption and uh, uh, judicial reforms agenda, which were offered by more than 20 civil society organizations. Uh, and um, promised to implement this list during his presidency. Uh, recently, we um, prepared similar list for, but, but now we call it the justice agenda because it is more white and it includes uh, the, the measures in the anti-corruption spheres, judicial, law enforcement, prosecutorial um, and others. Uh, and we will offer this agenda to be supported for the uh, political parties that are running to the parliament. Um, so if we, um, why we think that the rule of law reform is basically a top priority. Because again, I mentioned that a number of things had been implemented in Ukraine over the last five years, but then comes the Constitutional Court, decriminalizes illicit enrichment, and the e-declaration reform is not effective anymore. Or then comes Kyiv District Administrative Court and uh, uh, rolls back nationalization of Privat Bank, or decides to reinstate dubious um, official, or vice versa, to suspend somebody who is a reform-minded person like Ulyana Suprun um, during the, the, the winter time. And um, that is why judicial prosecutorial reforms, they should be relaunched from the very beginning, because unfortunately, these reforms didn't work uh, well. 
And I think that it's critically important to draw, draw the lessons from the anti-corruption reform and the establishment of new anti-corruption institutions that these reforms should be done with the participation of the international community and civil society and should start from the relaunch of the judicial and prosecutorial self-governance bodies. Those who basically decide on the career uh, appointments and dismissals of the judges and the prosecutors. If we talk about the police reform, and um, we had a successful part of the petrol police establishment, but unfortunately it didn't work well with the criminal police. So this part of the reform should also be implemented. Same with the law enforcement agencies that are still investigating economic crimes. Uh, there should be a separate agency, um, Financial uh, Investigations Bureau, that, that has to be dealing with all the investigations of the economic crimes. And existing law enforcement bodies should be deprived of this powers because unfortunately right now they are very often misusing them in order to put the pressure on businesses which is also not a good um, for the Ukrainian business climate. Um, in addition, um, so, so basically we think that the international partners should keep supporting the justice reforms agenda because that's something which is crucial for the citizens, for the businesses, for the foreign investors. And um, if we have uh, effective law enforcement and judicial systems, um, we wouldn't have problems uh, of the police officers covering up uh, or the prosecutors uh, officers covering up the murderers uh, of the activists like Katarina Handzuk. And for 10 months, we do not have any progress with the investigations and everything which is moving forward is doing that only because the, the uh, initiative group of the activists is pushing forward each and every step of the investigation. It shouldn't be doing manually. It should be done automatically with the existing rule of law mechanisms. Uh, we still have the leverages and we still have the instruments of uh, bigger engagement of the international community to the promotion of the reforms agenda, like macrofinancial assistance program, like the uh, IMF financial program. Uh, but also I think that we need uh, some more additional um, leverages, like for example, NATO membership plan. I think it could become not only a very important symbolic step uh, in approximation between Ukraine and NATO, but it could also be a very good framework for the reforms uh, in Ukrainian defense and security sectors, which are super important given the uh, ongoing Russian aggression um, with Ukraine. Of course, uh, doing the reforms is absolutely Ukrainian home task. We should be the owners of the reforms and we should not um, expect the international community to take over the responsibility or the, the tasks to do this. However, the last five years of the reforms proved that international community are very helpful in, in driving Ukrainian reforms forward and we are much more effective when we are working in synergy. That is why I think that Ukraine should keep moving in the same direction, which is the right direction, but with much more higher path. Because over the last two years, unfortunately, we lost some time. And um, that's something um, we should be working on because the momentum for the reforms is definitely not lost. Thank you. Um, thank you, Olena, for giving such a broad perspective and uh, um, uh, that you make it very clear that uh, a talks about corruption in Ukraine is actually not talks about only corruption, but it's mainly about good governance, rule of law, and justice. So we are we are considering it much as, as much broader topic. Uh, at this point, I want to give the floor back to the Washington students. Washington, right? Washington. Ah, no, no, no. To yeah. Brussels. To Brussels. Well, we're going to send it send it over to Brussels mm. right now. And then also, in my understanding, some breaking news from the Constitutional Court right now. Um, in Ukraine that it might be of interest to folks, that it sounds like the court has, uh, has agreed with the July 21st date for uh, parliamentary elections. So you heard it first from Washington. <laughs> 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 
All right. Well, let me let me do this while everybody chews on that um, and 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 looks at their uh, their sort of updates. Refresh, hit hit refresh. Is that still my too old? Um, Bruno, let me send it over to you in Brussels. And thank you. Uh, I just want to thank everyone from Brussels for being patient too. Uh, and uh, as as we move through uh, speakers, Bruno, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Jonathan. And in the, in the interest of time, let me just go straight to Richards, uh, who has been at the heart of many Ukraine policies in this city. So you have to wait a little bit, but uh, patience rewards. You now have the privilege to comment on everything that was said. Floor all yours, Richard. Bruno, thank you very much. Uh, Jonathan, thank you very much. Uh, Brad, uh, nice to hear your remarks. Good to see you. Uh, Olga and colleagues in uh, Kiev, very good to see you uh, too. Um, I have to say that my colleague uh, told me about the Constitutional Court five minutes before uh, Washington uh, revealed that. So uh, there is still a time to. Tin always has to be first, don't you know that? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Well, okay, okay, very good. Um, Jonathan, in, in your introductory remarks, you, you referred to uh, President Zelensky's visit to Brussels. I think it was both uh, significant uh, symbolically and in substance. Symbolically, it was the, his first foreign uh, visit. Uh, in substance terms, it both confirmed uh, the Euro-Atlantic direction which uh, uh, Ukraine has taken uh, over the past uh, five years, but it also gave us some ideas uh, of the new inflections, uh, the new priorities that the president would be uh, pursuing. And that's extremely useful because, as you rightly said, we now have uh, an EU-Ukraine summit coming up on the uh, 8th of July. And uh, as we can now say, we will have the elections on the 21st of July, which will result in a, in, in a new government. And as Brad, you rightly say, that government will be uh, a vital partner for the president in uh, mapping out uh, the course of Ukraine's future in the, in the next five years. I think what President Zelensky's uh, visit has done has uh, really helped us confirm that our, the three traps of our narrative on EU-Ukraine relations are the right, right ones. Uh, firstly, uh, that we are very much with Olga in highlighting the tremendous achievements of Ukraine since the Revolution of Dignity, uh, the tremendous achievements in EU-Ukraine relations over those uh, past five years. Uh, secondly, um, as others have commented, there is a lot still to be done, both on the internal uh, reform agenda uh, and on uh, the uh, implementation of the uh, EU-Ukraine Association Agreement. And the third track of our narrative is the very, very uh, steadfast support that uh, the EU, EU gives to Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial uh, integrity faced with the challenges that uh, uh, it, it faces day to day and increasingly. So let me just illustrate um, uh, some briefly some elements falling into those three tracks. Firstly, um, uh, trade between the EU and Ukraine has indeed increased dramatically over the three years of the application of the D DCFTA, 49% in fact, that's very significant. So the EU is now the main market for 42% of Ukrainian uh, products, which is good, new good news for uh, both sides uh, of, of the EU-Ukraine relationship. Uh, secondly, uh, as has been uh, commented by, by one of the speakers from Kiev, uh, we, have, we now have a visa-free regime in place, and this really has um, stepped up people-to-people uh, -people contacts between the EU uh, and Ukraine. Uh, thirdly, uh, a good number of reforms have indeed been achieved over the past five years, uh, which uh, are partly due to directly to the uh, commitments undertaken in the association agreement and partly due to the overall push that the implementation gives to democracy and the rule of law in, in, in Ukraine. Uh, we can refer to some specific sectors, important ones, competition, uh, public procurement, 
to name but two. Um, work is well underway in the area of pensions, healthcare and education. And as has been indicated, there have been some advances in the areas of judiciary and uh, anti-corruption. Um, uh, I'd like to refer to the recent elections, in fact. Uh, transitions of power are never easy. Uh, as uh, Jonathan, you rightly said, we've uh, witnessed uh, a difficult one in Moldova uh, over the past uh, uh, 10 days. I was with Commissioner Hahn yesterday in Chisinau, uh, and we were very pleased to be able to uh, welcome the peaceful transition in Moldova. Uh, it, it is an achievement, the, the transition of power in, in Ukraine, um, the strong attachment to democracy that that uh, uh, represents. And I agree with those who say that I think um, uh, the path of uh, Euro Atlantic, uh, the, the Euro Atlantic path of Ukraine and the path towards democracy and the rule of law is indeed now irreversible. Um, so those are some of the success stories I think that we must bear in mind are extremely important compared with, if you like, the period before the revolution of uh, dignity. But many of you have already referred to some of the areas where we still see uh, significant progress being needed, notably in the area of rule of law and fighting corruption. Uh, Olena, you mentioned to some of the serious concerns uh, or serious setbacks which have taken place recently, which are of significant concern to us. Um, a number of you have mentioned uh, the importance of completing uh, the unbundling process in the energy sector. Brad, you mentioned uh, a number of energy aspects. I think we would, from the EU perspective, we would put a high focus on the issue of uh, energy efficiency. Uh, Ukraine's energy security can be enhanced quite significantly by making inroads into uh, ensuring that uh, energy is used uh, uh, efficiently. Um, and I would um, say that foreign policy maybe is one area. I, I was interested in the remarks of from Kiev, uh, who, which saw that uh, um, Ukraine's role for the future will, will become more outward looking, taking part in uh, global debates on global issues. I, I very much agree with that. We in the EU uh, are, by our very essence, uh, 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 an entity which looks to partner uh, with other countries around the world, and we will be looking to step up our foreign policy coordination uh, with Ukraine uh, as Ukraine uh, develops as a country itself. Uh, we have a, a yearly survey of countries aligning to our CFSP statements. I have to say that we think Ukraine can do better in that respect. So that will be one area that we will be looking towards in the future, I think. Um, uh, Brad, made, Brad mentioned some figures. Let me mention the very, very significant figure of 14 billion euros in grants and loans that the EU has mobilized since 2014. We now, as I'm sure uh, our American friends do as well, look forward to going to the Toronto Reform Conference at the beginning of July, when we hope that uh, our Ukrainian friends will indicate uh, a little bit more detail to us about their reform priorities uh, going forward. So we're looking forward uh, to that. Then let me just briefly refer to the third track of our narrative, which is the uh, support for Ukraine's territorial integrity and sovereignty and independence. Um, things have not got uh, any better, shall we say. Last year, 2018, we saw the uh, uh, incidents uh, and developments uh, around the Azov Sea, the building of the Kerch Bridge, uh, the imposition of the inspection regime, and then, of course, the uh, incident in, on the uh, 24th uh, of, uh, of, of in November with the uh, detention of uh, 24 servicemen uh, and their vessels. Uh, we have called very strongly uh, for their uh, immediate and unconditional uh, return. We will continue to do to do that. We have and we've seen recently the uh, the uh, ruling of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea, and we uh, hope that Russia will. Uh, indeed uh, respect uh, that ruling. We have seen uh, the uh, welcome that President Putin has given to President Zelensky 
with the uh, decree uh, simplifying the issuing uh, of Russian passports to uh, Ukrainian citizens from non-government control uh, areas. This we regard as another attack on Ukraine's uh, sovereignty, undermining uh, the uh, Minsk uh, uh, agreements. So we give, uh, uh, we give full support to the Normandy format, the trilateral contact group, and the implementation of the uh, Minsk agreements. We are paying particular attention to uh, what we can do in the Azov Sea region in the light of developments last year, increasing our presence, looking at how we can uh, build uh, infrastructure, help build infrastructure in the region, uh, help um, uh, create economic opportunities uh, through SMEs and so forth. Um, we are uh, now extremely interested to learn about President Zelensky's uh, more inclusive approach with regard to Ukrainian citizens at or beyond uh, uh, the contact line. But we welcome his inclusive approach. Uh, where we will be interested to hear more about his uh, plans to facilitate crossing of the contact line solutions for pension payments and uh, as uh, our colleague in Kiev has said to learn more about his plans for Russian language uh, media uh, for Ukrainian citizens living uh, in the non-governmental non controlled areas. Let me, uh, let me finish by saying that uh, the European Council is uh, ongoing uh, at the moment. Uh, we suggest you watch this space uh, for um, statements coming out of the uh, European Council, but let me let me just refer to uh, the fact that obviously we have had the anniversary of the downing of MH17. Uh, we have had the uh, report of the investigation by the uh, the Dutch authorities uh, in that, and we hope uh, that uh, those um, uh, identified will be. Uh, brought uh, to justice. Um, so overall, um, uh, we, there are still some unknowns, and we hope that the Toronto conference will be an occasion where we hear some of, uh, the, or we, some of those unknowns will be answered. We will then have uh, our uh, EU-Ukraine uh, summit. We will then have the elections and the formation of the government, uh, and that is a process that we hope uh, can uh, really solidify uh, the EU-Ukraine relationship and give new momentum to the reforms which uh, are necessary to um, ensure that uh, rule of law and democracy in Ukraine become um, uh, taken for granted in the future. Thank you. Richard, many thanks for that. Um, I think your remarks testify that Ukraine is still on top of the policy agenda here, here in Brussels. but. Um, you know, here in town, and I'm sure also in Washington, we're all still sitting a little bit on the fence and uh, waiting to see how many of the promises will be delivered. But uh, I guess time will tell. So, Jonathan, over to you. Thank you. And thank you for that comprehensive um, uh, sort of overview on, on EU on EU policy. Um, I, it strikes me that when I hear you speak and when I hear Brad uh, speak, how closely uh, you share many of the same, both objectives, engagement, support for Ukraine um, on on sort of a host of topics. So I hope that, uh, and I know there will be many opportunities and uh, between EU and and the U.S. to continue to work together, uh, because I I can't think of a more important factor than transatlantic cooperation to support Ukraine. I was mentioned in Kiev the importance of, of both what's happening here on the ground in terms of civil society uh, and support for reforms, but also the important uh, role that the U.S. and EU are playing together to really uh, move move uh, a number of reforms forward, but also on the macroeconomic support through the IMF or through the U.S. or through the EU um, will be critical. What I wanted to do here in, uh, in Washington is maybe open it up just to take two questions, uh, and then we'll move back to both to Kiev and to, to Brussels. And um, whether we're doing uh, asking for questions here or in Brussels or Kiev, please just identify yourself, um, who you're affiliated with, um, and try to keep your questions brief um, so we can, we can uh, speak, uh, we can get responses to your questions. And we'll bundle uh, two together right now. Uh, in Washington. So please uh, raise your hand if you have any, any specific questions. 
Okay, I see one here. Uh, we'll start with uh, Tamori. Thank you very much. My name is Tamori Yakubashvili. You can guess that I'm Georgian. Um, I'm with the TY strategies here. So um, I don't want to play a devil's advocate. I want to be a little bit more sobering speaker here or commentator. So what I hear basically was that self-congratulatory uh, rhetorics. Um, everybody here in Brussels and in Ukraine learned how to say the right words in the right sentences. That's very good, but not enough. Uh, as um, on the reflecting on some what was already said, I mean, Ukraine will be the champion of the reforms. Ukraine can be, but there was already one champion called Georgia. We know the sad story of that reforms what's happening now and today. Uh, and, uh, you know, it somehow irritates me, people talking about how much Ukraine has achieved. What Ukraine has achieved that through that achievement, so-called, we got Zelensky elected. And that's a verdict of those reforms. So is after two revolutions, doing some cosmetic reforms is not going to be enough for a country like Ukraine or any country. Um, on military assistance that everybody is so happy, too little, too late. And the Ukrainians got these anti-tank missiles when they never needed it anymore. I mean, it's good to have, but they were too late. Minsk process, it's a process created to freeze the conflict, not to solve it. And we know how it's working. Judicial reform, to quote my friend uh, uh, from Bulgaria, you know, he said that uh, judicial reform is like advancing on a graveyard. No help is expected. So um, don't be too focused on that because you have so many other things that you have to uh, put in order uh, before you go there. Anti-corruption. After so many efforts and institutions built, Tomorrow, nothing uh, happens. Sorry I'm to... coming to okay. the final things. So what I do not hear here is... Uh, more about parliamentary elections, because the Rada will be decisive in anything that we call the reform or economic agenda or foreign policy agenda. What's going to happen there? What are the predictions? What people's hopes are? What is the EU and the US going to do with the absolutely new, innovative and brilliant proposal of Zelensky to engage with occupied territories? You know, not that we like it. Thank you. What are you going to do about it? How you are going to support Ukrainian government in achieving that goal? And there was a very right idea that if we really want to reform the Ukrainian military, we should give to Ukraine membership action plan. It's the be best reform tool that NATO invented, and there is a very good proof uh, in Eastern Europe for that. When is going to happen? So these are my three questions. And sorry for lengthy comments. Okay, well, we'll just, well, we have one other question here um, quickly. And I think on that question, on sort of support for Ukraine's East and NATO, um, sort of next steps, um, maybe that would be handled by maybe if Brad and, and uh, uh, Richard would be willing to uh, respond uh, to that. But hold on one second, one more question. Okay. Uh, my name is Kastas Vashkalavichus. I'm from Embassy of Lithuania. I would like to return back a little bit to that enthusiasm and uh, comment on the limited success of, of Ukraine achievements, limited achievements, and because success for Ukraine oversteps far, far beyond Ukrainian borders. My question regards two achievements. One would be in the nearest future, another in the long-term future. Uh, first of all, Ukraine really needs a quick victory, so maybe it's a question for Kiev. What would be that, you know, first steps, the first quick achievements that you are aiming at? And second would be a longer term looking, especially um, changing the mentality, influencing that, and this information channel, Russian-speaking channel. Do you have more kind of elaboration on that? Because it's really a very important achievement looking into the long-term future. Uh, go and try to answer those questions. I think we just have to move because we, we have to fortunately have some time. So maybe we could start off with 
Um, there was a couple of questions. One about sort of uh, sort of next steps on on NATO and how do you sort of lock in both reforms and progress on on the NATO track. And then there was also the question, I think, a very good one too, about how can um, you know what can be done both in Ukraine. And I appreciate hearing that the, uh, President Zelensky is paying a great deal of attention to Ukrainians in the East. And addressing, I think, challenges there, and I think that it's been praised by both in Brussels and Washington this effort. So uh, I think this is one of which uh, maybe uh, to back to Kiev about sort of what can be done uh, in the east, but also. I know that the U.S. and the EU both have uh, assistance and programs uh, in the East and have both long sought to uh, to make it a priority that that part of Ukraine be focused on. Uh, but I think it, maybe I'll send it back to Kiev to answer that question. And then we also had uh, sort of the last question here, um, which I'm hoping colleagues in Kiev can can respond to about uh, particularly about sort of achievements, quick achievements. You know, what would be things that uh, the new government, if, I, if I'm right, maybe I'm not getting this right, that they should be doing that they could do right away to bolster the enthusiasm of those. And I, I get a sense that that have a lot of hopes in placed in this new government to move Ukraine forward uh, quickly and I, I, on on sort of its path, uh, whether it be into corruption or in terms of other uh, domestic agenda items that have an impact on foreign and domestic policy. So maybe we'll start with Kiev to respond. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Thank you for the guests who addressed our speakers with questions. Um, I would like to start with Olga, uh, probably, with uh, uh, a question about uh, EU, NATO, EU, or not EU, but Ukraine's NATO cooperation and uh, possible membership action plan, etc. Thank you, Vasil. Actually, EU NATO cooperation is also a very interesting uh, question. Uh, th thank you so much, and uh, it's uh, very good that uh, um, uh, it is clear for everybody that membership of Ukraine to NATO is not a matter of like political discussion. So it's about security, and there are like little alternative and room for maneuver for this issue. And I'm really happy to hear it also from Svetoslav and from our NGO, and uh, also from colleagues from Brussels in Washington. Uh, well, when we're talking about membership in the European Union, and I'm really happy to see on the Brussels line, Richard, and we discussed it so many times that um, like whether it would be a referendum or not, uh, it is a matter of mentality. We should understand that Ukraine have become a natural partner to European Union and EU has become a natural partner to Ukraine. And then we can also start talking about membership. Uh, but so far, all our integration is based on association agreement. And uh, becoming a natural partner for EU uh, is uh, the path which should be gone through by implementation of the association agreement. For this, we do not need referendum. It's a matter of political discussion. And also, uh, when we're talking about membership with the European Union, uh, EU is not yet forming the new enlargement policy. So the uh, we have only partnership policy so far, but the Ukraine has been a trendsetter here because we launched the sectoral integration. We started to cooperate closely with Norway, uh, which is not member of EU but a member of the EU market, which is not a membership format of integration with European Union. The same, the aggressive approach of Turkey is also very important for us. So we should not put the issue of membership of the, uh, with the European Union uh, to the table right now. It's not a matter of discussion so far. We have to implement the agreement. We have to become a part of market and we we should become a natural partners with the European Union. And when it comes to political decision, it should take place. But it is far not the issue of discussion of the upcoming years. And uh, it's very important just to conjunct this discussion, although with the quick wins, which should be might be uh, might be uh, seen in the upcoming uh, time. And it would largely depend on the a new combination of the Ukrainian parliament because uh, most of the political parties building their program programs on those problems which were not resolved in a co course of the last five years and especially this program is has a lot of accents uh, in the uh, election program of the elected president Vladimir Zelensky. So and there are so many outstanding issues which should be decided by the decisions of the parliament. It's about land reform, it's about decentralization reform, it's about impeachment and different 
and political issues, and it's also about it's about uh, uh, anti-corruption issues, but also it's very important to say that um, I fully share the necessity to concentrate more on the issues of rule of law and fight against corruption, but I don't think that we should go back to concentration with the boarding on judiciary and the reform of judiciary, because the demand of people on Euromaidan was not about the judiciary, it was about justice, about delivering justice. And uh, in course of the last 15 years, we We've been transforming the system of judiciary for so many times, and maybe now it's time to talk about the quality of justice, the quality of the decisions taken by the courts. And here, uh, it's about evaluation. And for example, if uh, the decisions of the commercial court of first instances have been appealed in 100%, maybe it's about the quality of justice. It's not about the combination of the court. So, uh, so I would really encourage everybody to put the accents on some mental issues, some issues which are the demand of the society, but the quick wins I see also for as first time after the election of the new parliament and the adoption of those outstanding decisions where populism and political consensus wasn't there in the existing convocation. Uh, thank you, Olga. Then back to Svetoslav Yurash. Maybe your comments on what was uh, um, asked by our speakers, so namely hopes of people in the Rada, uh, f f hopes about new 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 parliament, and uh, any kind of plans for engaging um, people of Donbas and Crimea to, so to say, all Ukrainian context. EU NATO, you already elaborated, and about quick wins. Thank you. Yes, I'll try to address the questions which I outlined from our uh from our conversation. So first on uh, the self-congratulations. Indeed, there is that problem. And there's the problem of the complete uh, gap that was in between those who implemented some of the pro forma reforms of the last five years and those who felt the reality of it. And we want to finally stop that. We want to stop uh, Ukrainian officials going to your capitals and telling you about all the accomplishments and successes. And then you hearing from both activists in Ukraine and your journalists that it is not what is on the ground. We will certainly stop with the hypocrisy on that regard. Second question, parliamentary elections and the parliamentary situation. Uh, most likely, we will end up, for the first time in Ukrainian history, a uh, party majority. So a single party will form a majority in parliament, which will be our party, Zelensky political party, the servant of the people. Uh, our our members are very varied and very different both from their background and their priorities. But they are all united around the program, which is very much public and very much to be seen and very much outlines all the things we have discussed here. Both the anti-corruption, the Euro-Atlantic integration, the economic liberali liberalization, and putting as much power as possible in the hands of the people, making uh, as few intermediaries between them and decisions on the ground as possible. And we, on the question of quick win wins, to jump here, we are not focused on quick wins. We understand that that outstanding majority, which Mrs. Zelensky uh, won, and the majority which we will most likely win in the parliamentary elections are there for a reason. And that reason is fundamental reforms that we finally need to implement for Ukrainian people to feel the difference between the previous governments, which were certainly doing some things on the margins, but still the main picture remained and very unfortunate picture, alas. And uh, we will try to change that finally. And th th therefore, we will not be focusing on quick wins. We will be focusing on fundamental reforms that we need to implement. Uh, on the question of Minsk, pro Minsk process, yes. I certainly agree that the current situation is very much uh, stating and uh, essentially provides for about a dozen of our soldiers dying every single week with no change in front lines, which is a most egregious situation. And therefore, we will try to change the reality of the Minsk process to get something done. Alas, that is the process which we ended up with, and we don't have much of a choice as far as engagement with Russia to stop attacking us in the east of Ukraine. And uh, certainly the question of the membership action plan will be very welcome, and the question of NATO integration as a fundamental pillar of our long-term security prospects is very much needed and something that our government will, will focus on getting as much as possible. Uh, other than that, on the question of information reaching out to the Ukrainians in occupied territories, uh, you will hear 
all, all the plans announced soon. I will not break here any uh, news, but alas, we are planning a various sides to that campaign. We are planning a TV channel which is going to transmit in Russian the perspectives which we have on the situation both there and in Ukraine uh, effectively and far more engagingly than many of the Ukrainian state media now does. Uh, aside from that, we will both, as we demonstrated in the elections, have quite a bit of the media savviness, uh, social media savviness, which we, we will use to battle on the, most, on the hottest front line in our battle with Russia, that is information war with Russia. We have certainly some guns to pre present there and to battle Russia with. Uh, and we will engage with the people who are essentially hundreds of thousands of which are trying to get to Ukraine every single week. And we are seeing a gross negligence to both their well-being uh, and the easiness, ease in with which they can cross the front line. We want to change that. We want to finally allow Ukrainians to feel welcome when they come to Ukrainian control part on Donbass, uh, not to mention the issues with engagement uh, with Ukrainians in Crimea, which is a whole separate matter. Uh, on, the question of, uh, on the question of a general picture of anti-corruption, I must mention here that that is our central priority. You understand that is something that essentially is, uh, is the reality of every Ukrainian and battle with every day, and trying to, again, lessen the burden of bureaucracy, which is allowing all that corruption to foster first, and second, uh, reshuffling and changing and cleaning out most of, the most of the law enforcement agencies which aren't delivering neither the justice nor the review of egregious corruption, which is happening almost every day in our country, is something we will achieve. And we are presenting proposals on that right now uh, within the constraints of the presidential powers w when we will get to the parliament we will present many more more ambitious and clear plans for everyone to see that we are not what was here for 28 years thank you Svetoslav and finally to Olena Halushka uh, maybe summarizing on two things um, expectations of the people for the new parliament right and quick wins and uh, probably quick wins what could we get from the um, as you mentioned uh, rather new to our audience and ukraine and foreign audience the uh, justice agenda which was presented just a few days ago and basically that's very interesting because when the people are asked what are the problems which they personally feel they usually name some social socio-economical issues, the energy tariffs or pension salaries, etc., etc. But when they are asked what are the key obstacles for the development of the country, what are the problems for the country, they usually say together with the war that corruption is uh, usually in top three um, issues, top three problems for, for the That is why there is the huge demand and huge hunger from the Ukrainian society for Justice, I would agree, but I would a little bit disagree here that justice won't appear without cleansing up the existing systems. Because I, I just found some statistics very interesting that out of 5,600 of the judges who passed qualification assessment uh, in the course of, um, of the judicial reform, which started after the Maidan, only 15 people were dismissed as the ones who cannot administer justice. The rest confirmed their um, uh, ability to, um, to deliver justice. That is the problem. That is why we think that it didn't work out before and it has to be restarted. Because if we talk, for example, about the Supreme Court, the candidates who could not explain their or property or who said that they collected money, they received money for their luxurious property by collecting berries in Germany, and the judicial self-governance bodies green-lighted them to administer justice, this is not okay, unfortunately. It shouldn't be working that way. Um, with regards to, uh, to, to the uh, absence of the results of the anti-corruption reform, I have to say uh, just a very quick comment that over the last five years, uh, Ukraine has been building up the institutions and the last instu missing institution in this um, uh, chain 
of the new bodies to fight against high-profile corruption, anti-corruption court. It was established very recently, and it will start considering uh, high-profile corruption cases only in September. So it would need a few more months to start finally reviewing the cases, which previously not considered and blocked by the ordinary courts, and only a few months afterward, we'd be able to judge about their efficiency, how they are considering these cases, whether they are issuing investigative warrants, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, in time, and whether they are resisting the pressure, uh, etc. Now today, it's a little bit too early to judge finally that the anti-corruption infrastructure is effectively working uh, or is not. With regards to the quick wins, um, well, the president already submitted to the parliament the, the law to criminalize back illicit in and also to introduce the civil forfeiture as one of the tools to confiscate the assets uh, and justified assets of public officials. This could be a quick win. Moreover, one more technical issue um, was recently uh, done by the president. Um, for the last uh, few years, well, after now published, um, the, the cases which NABU is investigating, they are very complicated and a lot of money, of course, is being laundered through foreign jurisdictions. So this money do, uh, does not end up in Ukrainian uh, jurisdiction. But in order to get the evidence from the foreign law enforcement agencies to send all of the requests via the prosecutor's general office, which of course stalled all of these um, requests uh, and very often leaked the information or uh, prevented the law enforcement, foreign law enforcement agencies from um, pre preventing NABU from getting this information in time. Uh, the president uh, ordered um, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to correct this issue and to inform the international organizations that NABU is an independent body which is the subject to this mutual legal assistance, meaning that all of this evidence can now be um, um, requested and accepted, received um, directly um, by NABU uh, by passing prosecutor's general office. Um, of course, we are expecting much more comprehensive reforms, and we are expecting that uh, the new government will be in a constant and, uh, discussions and dialogue with Ukrainian civil society, uh, but, but, but that's something which is already done. And the last issue on the cooperation with NATO, um, last year, uh, the, the coalition of the international uh, partners like the US, uh, NATO, EU helped to advocate for the adoption of a very important law on the national security. And this law paves the way for the comprehensive reform of the security service of Ukraine. Because together with the very important um, functions, which uh, this agency uh, is the only one implement, like counter-terrorism, counter-intelligence, protection of the state secrecy. It is also tasked with the, um, fighting against corruption and investigating of the economic crimes, which, as I mentioned during my um, previous presentation, they are uh, unfortunately very often misusing as the media reports uh, and the companies are talking. So uh, I think that uh, the joint cooperation between the international partners, NATO and Ukrainian civil society reformers in the authorities on reforming the security service of Ukraine can also be a very good, maybe not a quick win, but some will be a part of a very comprehensive package of the reforms, which is very long overdue. Thanks. Thank you very much, Elena. And um, we are getting back to Washington. Great. I want to uh, just turn it over to, to Bruno. Uh, to see if there's any in, in Brussels, and then also if Richard, I don't know if you wanted to also respond to to any of the issues that were raised and, and weigh in uh, from from Brussels. Yeah. Thank you, Jonathan. There are questions, um, so we'll just take them together and get back to Richard then for final comments. Um, I have one there, please, and please introduce yourself as well, sir. <coughs> Hello, my name is Ivor Kokoyak. I'm um, the head of the Association of Ukrainians in Belgium. And my question is to Sjotosaw Juras. You presented the referendum as the, having the potential of being unified or unified. Uh, well, 
In my opinion, it's not exactly the characteristic of referendum. If you look, for instance, at Brexit, it's not exactly unifying and it's quite damaging. How are you going to avoid this kind of damaging effect and how will we make sure that it's unified? Thank you very much. We take note of that question and keep it uh, and go back to the panel. Sir? Um, Josh Kurkonas on News Agency of Ukraine, a short comment uh, and a short question. First uh, comment, I just want to strongly support uh, the Olga's and Richard's uh, uh, opinion concerning that Ukraine is not and should not be considered like a uh, uh, subject, uh, object, uh, excuse me, in the uh, plane uh, between uh, big powers, uh, including uh, Russia, EU and US. And you know, there is a very simple reason for that, because uh, we are fighting every day for our freedom with uh, the Russian Empire. And we are absolutely sure that nobody, instead of us, uh, will be doing so. So that is a reason uh, to be uh, like, uh, to have an out voice. In, uh, in that regard, maybe we are doing our part uh, of the path, but the path is uh, the common. And now the question. Here uh, in Brussels, sometimes we can feel uh, that there is such a perception that uh, the relations between West and Russia are some kind of wave uh, uh, which has uh, its ups and down, uh, downs. And uh, now uh, the down point uh, uh, of relations is uh, close to be reached, and uh, that's mean that uh, another stage is like uh, uh, rising in relations between Russia uh, and uh, the, the big West, let me say so. And there are some formal uh, uh, approval of, uh, of uh, that, uh, that point of view. So my question is, uh, what kind of price in uh, the context of uh, European and Euro-Atlantic integration of Ukraine could be uh, paid uh, for such kind of improvement of relations with West and Russia. I mean, what kind of compromise could the West propose and what kind of compromise could Ukraine accept in that regard? I believe this is a relevant question to three sides for Washington, for Kiev and for Brussels. Thank you. Thank you very much for your very real question. Uh, I hope we do not have to pay prices for that, but uh, thank you for that. Richard, um, you have an array of issues and questions to respond, and uh, since we take the word German very seriously at the German Marshall Funds, <laughs> uh, if you could do so in five to ten minutes, that, that would be well, well, so thank me, you very much. Well, let me pick and choose then. In that. Uh, on the RADA elections, we do see the RADA as a key partner in uh, the further promotion of reforms and, and, and change uh, in Ukraine. Um, we'd, like to re we'd like to refer to the government parliament uh, roadmap that was agreed uh, under the uh, previous, uh, for the implementation of the uh, association agreement. We think that kind of cooperation is going to be needed uh, in the future. Um, so that's my general, po general point on the RADA. The more uh, specific one maybe is that we hope to see a generational change in the RADA, and I know uh, I speak for some dates in particular when I say we hope to see uh, many more women uh, in the RADA. Um, uh, that is a strong point. Uh, we will even try and get it into the summit declaration uh, in one form or another. Uh, I, uh, generational change and gender balance, I think, um, are key things that we like uh, 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 RADA. Um, we will uh, wait for uh, Mr. Zelensky's ideas in, in particular on the uh, business of how to approach uh, Ukrainians uh, beyond the contact line in, in an inclusive way. We're already doing a lot in eastern Ukraine in terms of uh, to make it easier for people to cross the contact line. Uh, we obviously have uh, a significant strategic communications and disinformation uh, effort uh, going on uh, uh, as well. We have been uh, supporting the Ukrainian public broadcaster for many years. One thing that that has taught us is that uh, if the Ukrainian state does not put the financial resources into a public broadcaster, then public broadcasters don't work. So any Russian language uh, media exercise will have the same, if you like, uh, commercial viability issue that the public broadcaster has faced. Um, in terms of quick victories, I uh, share uh, the idea that uh, we should get the illicit enrichment uh, uh, law back on the books in conformity with international standards and the Ukrainian constitution. Uh, uh, like Olena said in one of her earlier remarks, 
Uh, once operational, I hope we see the first high-level convictions uh, processed by the High Anti-Corruption Court. For the longer term, um, I would hope that a combination of the further process of decentralization combined with the demonopolization uh, of uh, the economy will see that change of mentality that uh, uh, our Georgian friend uh, referred to. Um, uh, I agree with Bruno. Uh, there should be no price on put on Ukraine's sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity. We would have hoped that Mr. Surkov would have reacted more positively uh, to the ideas of Kurt Volker regarding, and, our, and our Ukrainian friends regarding the idea of a UN peacekeeping force as a, as a way uh, to uh, transition to the re-establishment of uh, the territorial integrity uh, of Ukraine, but uh, our Russian friends have uh, decided not to pick up uh, that very good. Thanks. Thank you, Richard. Um, well, uh, over to Washington. Yeah. Um, I mean, well, we're, we're cl I know we're close to sort of the time stop time. So what I wanted to do is maybe um, uh, maybe just turn it over to Brad if, to weigh in on some of the topics that were raised, but also uh, certainly some final uh, comments. And I think it was interesting what Richard had said on sort of Russia and sort of uh, way forward on, on Minsk and, and, and undoubtedly the, the West. Uh, Kurt Volker was mentioned. Uh, has put forward some ideas on how to move forward, but have been rebuffed. Um, but a number of times to reforms to uh, to Minsk. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over to Brad first. Then I'll send it over to Kiev, uh, both to respond to the questions, but also uh, to sort of uh, make any final remarks so we can try to uh, to to close this cl as close as possible to the time allotted. Brad, over to you to to respond. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, the uh, I want to just respond. Thanks. There we go. Just respond. A couple. Of, there, there are several issues that, that I see as interrelated. Um, the the Minsk process, um, outreach to to uh, Ukrainians in Donbass, and and the question of of military assistance. I think the 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 problem with Minsk is not. That that it's fundamentally flawed. The problem with Minsk um, is that Russia is not engaging in good faith, and it needs to happen for Minsk to succeed uh, is for the Russians to stop backing its proxies in uh, in eastern Ukraine and to withdraw its forces from uh, from from eastern Ukraine. Um, what would turn this I mean, into a frozen conflict would be if, uh, as the Russians proposed, we were to um, you know, deploy peacekeepers along the line of contact and then uh, and then leave it open as to when or whether um, peacekeepers would be deployed in, in the in the other areas. Peacekeepers need to be deployed from the line of the Russian border and they need to verify the withdrawal of, of uh, Russian forces. Um, under those circumstances, uh, certainly Minsk uh, can and and will work. That doesn't mean that we're not open to to other to new ideas, um, and and I think President Zelensky um, ideas in terms of one of which is how do you how do you bring more pressure to bear on the Russians? And one of these is you you go directly to the population in uh, in the occupied uh, in the areas that are controlled by Russia or occupied by Russia, um, and um, show them that they uh, of of Ukraine that that life on uh, on the Ukrainian side um, is better than it is on uh, in, under Russian control. Um, there are areas where we can help with with uh, with information um, you know but we need to, what we need to see is is the the new administration's plan and then we can move ahead together to see how we can help implement it but it's, it has to be a it has to be a Ukrainian lead we're not going to tell them how how to do this I think um, you know especially when it comes to strategic communication with your own people that's not something we should be telling Ukraine how to do with um, implementation um, and uh, you know finally on the issue of, of uh, defense assistance um, 
the the idea that Ukraine is going to take that territory back militarily is ludicrous. And so, um, you know, this has to be a, a political solution. Um, at the time of the uh, Russian attacks in 2014, Ukraine had about 5,000 soldiers uh, who were um, uh, adequately trained and equipped to fight. That has changed dramatically um, in, in the ensuing, and, and I think clearly the, um, the objective of security assistance uh, is not to create a Ukrainian force that can, that can defeat Russia. That's, um, that's absurd. But the purpose is to raise the cost to Russia if it decides to it's aggression, to make sure that, that Russia will pay a high price in terms of, of, uh, of blood and treasure should they escalate in, in, in Ukraine. And, that, and they will pay a much higher cost. And I have no doubt that, that Ukraine is much better prepared and willing and able to fight at very high cost if uh, Russia decides to escalate militarily. Um, so I think these are all part of, you know, of, of you have to look at, um, as Klaus would say, uh, you know, um, uh, war is the extension of politics. And, and I think the piece that Zelensky has latched on to, I mean, I think he fundamentally grasps this. And, and stepping back even from Donbass, when he, uh, in response to the, to the Russian offer to, to provide passports to, uh, to Ukrainian citizens in Donbass, the, the way he disparaged that essentially said, well, you know, the Russian passport will convey, uh, you know, the right uh, to, uh, uh, to not have free and fair elections or, and to not be able to publicly, uh, you know, express dissenting points of view. The, the fundamental uh, threat that Zelensky poses is to create, to create a Ukraine that shows the rest of the former Soviet space what um, a free and democratic uh, country um, uh, can look like, and that's a real threat, not just uh, to to um, other authoritarian to, to Putin himself and to the t the type of contrast to the authoritarian government in Moscow um, is the biggest the, and the most fundamental threat that that um, Zelensky can can present. And I, I only I say only half jokingly that I hope he has a food tester. Um, because he, if he lives up to his potential um, and can help transform Ukraine, um, that's very threatening to, uh, to authoritarians everywhere. So uh, I'll stop with that. Brad, thank you. And uh, Vassal, I'm going to just turn it over to you. And I just sort of based on timing uh, for, for folks here to respond to the, the speakers, but also of us, I would ask that you, you know, at that point, we'll, we'll close the event. So we're going to give colleagues in, in Kiev the, the last word. Thank you, Jonathan. Could we have um, at least one or two minutes for each speaker and two minutes for concluding remarks? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, um, who wants to start with uh, final, so to say, comments and final remarks? Questions as well. Okay, yeah, fine. I mean, comments to for the to the questions to what was said uh, in Brussels and Washington, and final remarks. Yes. Uh, first, on the questions on the referendum. Uh, first and foremost, this is something that will not be done now. Uh, this is something that will be in the end of the process. It, you are right that if held now, these referendums will be divisive, very divisive, and very difficult to conduct. The reality is closer to the possibility of being members of either EU or NATO, people will feel those benefits which we see and can propagate. So that will be an easier message to convey. As in those other European cases where various European countries had the referendums in the end of the process of accession, it was overwhelmingly in favor of joining either NATO or EU, such it will be here. I think it is very important in the process of building that example of a democratic post-Soviet state to engage with your people rather than to hide from them. And uh, instruments like a referendum or a uh, of various kinds is exactly 
Second point about the compromise with Russia. We said on many occasions continuously that first and foremost we will never compromise territory. We will never give territory that was stolen from us in a war which killed as many as 13,000 Ukrainians away. Uh, second, we have many Ukrainian prisoners held both in occupied territories, be it in Crimea, on Donbass, and in Russia. And we will do everything possible to try and get them back. And we hope for help from our European and transatlantic partners in that process. Uh, alas, the details of whatever deal can be reached with Russia should be discussed as they are a medical speculation is, of course, fun. Alas, it is unproductive. So uh, the closer we get to some possible deal with Russia, then we can discuss the details of it and what is acceptable or unacceptable. But our red line is very clear, people and territory. And we will not step back from those points. Uh, last, there was the matter of um, there's the matter of uh, the the parliament and the fact that we will have we will have a much younger parliament. I myself an example of that. Fortunately or not, uh, that that is the the youngest uh, future MP uh, in the parliament in Ukraine's history. And second, yes, more women engaged with parliamentary affairs. Although we are looking at a various number of instruments to be used there, uh, starting uh, from political engagement, political education, and not just the blunt instruments such as quotas can be. Uh, and with those instruments, we are seeing results r right now. More than a third of our party lists are, and not just any women, but accomplished women with various uh, points to suggest and to accomplish. First and foremost, on the anti-corruption front, we have the very best lady who is leading the anti-corruption one of the best anti-corruption NGOs and has led the NABU uh, Civil Council. That is number four in our party lists and husbands there. So that's on the questions front. Uh, on the question of um, final remarks, I want to first stress our great gratitude one minute, yes. Uh, our great gratitude to our European and transatlantic partners uh, on everything they have done to help us stay alive in this battle with Russia and to tr we hope to uh, give back and provide you the examples that our state is not only a beggar, but is a success that people not just have to be forced to engage with, but want to engage with. And as some of the speakers said there, they should be lining up competing for a business here. We will do everything to happen, both security-wise, foreign policy-wise, and economics-wise. Uh, thank you, Svetoslav. Next, who wants to step up? Okay, Olena Halushka. Um, I would like to very briefly um, comment on the possible compromise um, which might be done between countries and Russia. Uh, each uh, package of the sanctions which Western countries put on Russia, they were linked to a very concrete and very clear violation. And if Western countries reverse these sanctions without Russia fully and completely and roll back this violation to the um, normal state, and that would mean um, the surrender. And this surrender would be considered by Russia as the green light for their further violence and further crimes. And um, here I would like to draw your attention to a situation which is right now happening in the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, which may unconditionally return Russian delegation uh, to, to the assembly, uh, which would basically mean turning the blind eye on all of the resolutions which uh, Earl passed, um, which were the response to Russia's aggression and Russia's war in Ukraine and uh, um, uh, annexation of Crimea. And human rights defenders started a huge campaign. And I mean, I'm not talking about the work which is done uh, by diplomats behind the closed doors. Um, uh, organizations started a huge worldwide campaign um, which are aimed at calling the representatives of all of the national delegations uh, of PASE not to return Russia to the assembly before Russia releases all Kremlin hostages, because they are right now Russia in Donbas, in Crimea, around 250 Ukrainian citizens which were illegally detained. And if Russia is not ready to take this first step, uh, at least 
to start the dialogue with the um, uh, PASE. Any kind of unconditional return would be immediate as the green light, especially given that such a decision might be taken just a few weeks after the tribunal ruled Russia to release all um, sailors and vessels, and Russia is completely ignoring this. That is why no compromises without any um, actions um, uh, taken uh, by Russia. Um, very concluding remarks, uh, two points. First, um, we are asking the international partners to uh, keep helping us doing the comprehensive reforms in the rule of law sector, fighting against corruption, those tools which are effective, and uh, let's keep moving forward. And the second issue, uh, we are very kindly asking the international partners to also do your homework. Because as I mentioned, uh, the uh, foreign jurisdictions uh, are basically the parking space. A lot of dirty money which are coming from, and specifically from Russia, and from Russia they are coming as the tool and instrument of their hybrid war. And the recent scandal which appeared in Austria is also one of the um, one of the um, proofs for that. Um, that is why please keep um, uh, anti money laundering legislation and help us fighting uh, against corruption um, also for, for, from that side of the Western countries. Thank you. Yes, Olga, your final remarks. Uh, thank you, Vasil. Just like uh, uh, three reflections and a very final remarks about Minsk agreement. So, in, in course of this discussion, it's very important to outline that, like we all uh, re should recognize that whether this is an effective or ineffective form, and whether it's good or bad, it's uh, it's nothing for Russian Federation, who, who which is not adhering at least to this agreement, the other new format. So, we should not really um, um, put out. Uh, of the focus this discussion and of course it's very important that the the engagement uh, with the with this popu with those population which is unoccupied territories is is a priority it's very important but we should not really also put it on the weight creation of these territories and and uh, um, uh, and put it in get as a separate format so this is the part of the of the general process and I also wanted to reflect on the compromises uh, uh, question which sounded from uh, Brussels. Uh, actually, uh, I, I don't think that so far at this stage we're a uh, discussion because uh, we were talking about compromises back in 2013 when we were talking about which kind of vector of uh, uh, development we should choose. And uh, actually when the annexation of Crimea and occupation of Donbass started, uh, this was a shock for the whole world, but uh, this wasn't a new format for you. Uh, put an influence on the other country. So this is uh, the same case as Nagorno Karabakh, the same case as Transnistria, the same case as Chechnya and Echkeria, and the same case is the same case as was Georgia. But actually Ukraine was the only country uh, whose uh, annexation and occupation of territory was strong uh, free world, we call it Western world, but I like more the wording free world uh, by all the international institutions. We appeal to the court. We, um, uh, the UN have uh, issued the resolution on the legal annexation of Crimea. We have unprecedented scope of sanctions, not only from EU and Japan, from Canada, from Australia, from all the free world which were united against condemning this. So it's not, it's not about the choices. So why wouldn't Ukraine be the first country in this region to bring its territories back. So and we have all the chances and we should here bring back ourselves to the thesis where we are trying to the foreign policy and we're the formers of the new policy which could reverse the whole agenda of the Russian Federation which is already stressed by such a strong condemnation of, uh, of uh, support uh, and support to territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine. Uh, the same goes to choices and compromise integration and uh, choosing the vector of development. Uh, it's much easier for Ukraine to speak about European and Euro-Atlantic integration because A, we totally reversed our trade uh, to, to the free world, to the European Union primarily. So Russian capital and its share in Ukraine business is is much less now than they since 
2015, we do not buy Russian gas. And uh, together with occupation of territory, gas, uh, gas blackmailing is a normal practice for Russia, which has been a normal practice for, uh, for Baltics and for other countries uh, which are EU members. So we do not already the object of this, the territorial integrity and recognition of Russia as aggressor is un undiscussable all around the world. So what are the uh, further instruments of influence for Ukraine? There is no one from Russia Federation, so we do not have to compromise any discussions where we have to move forward. And uh, and this were the reflections, and now to the final remarks. This will be only a remark from my side, concluding the whole discussion and uh, putting some uh, some um, outputs for myself. Is that uh, regardless? Um, uh, different, uh, different countries, different uh, uh, discussions. We all are united around the same topics. Huge credit that we all have managed to build in course of five years. The uh, civil society, Ukrainian population, people, governments, uh, MPs, uh, new powers which uh, are coming to the parliament, this all the, the same agenda that we have. Who were successful in this agenda? More or more successful, the time will show. But I think that the primary and important thing is that we all are united around the same values, around the same approaches, and it's very important for me to hear the same messages we're voicing here from Brussels and from Washington. So thank you, colleagues, for this discussion. It was like very important. Thank you very much, Olga Stefanishina. Um, I want to thank all the audience which gathered in Kiev, uh, and I'm very sorry that we have almost no time for the questions, uh, which will probably, and I very much hope, uh, will have next time. Just three remarks from my side, and possibly also on behalf on the um, broader civil society and reanimation package of reforms. The first, there is a very popular saying that if Russia stops fighting, there will be no more war. If Ukraine stops fighting, there will be no more Ukraine. We are very much relying on um, international support and uh, society consensus um, that Ukraine one day will become NATO and European Union member. And if you go back to the pools of the last fourth see that this is a strong majority in favor of these things. It gets me back to the second point. Ukrainian population, population, so Ukrainian society of the revolution of dignity, defines itself at the part of the West, which we were historically, and we are now getting back politically and economically. Our colleagues in Washington, in Brussels, in uh, uh, US Department, in European External Service, also man made this point that uh, Ukraine is considered as part of the West. We are not only partners, but we, we, we are getting back to be th this part as uh, our um, Slovakian and other colleagues did just, just a few uh, years or a decade ago. And thirdly, uh, we very much as civil society rely on uh, not only societal support, but also support of international partners, and we encourage you to societies um, agenda on domestic reforms, which will be also presented uh, soon in the Ukraine Reform Conference in Toronto on the 2nd uh, to the 4th of July, right? Um, and uh, as the last thing, civil society, one of the main drivers of reforms for the last five years, we uh, give this clear message that, that we um, very much hope that U.S. support, EU support to civil society organizations, to grassroots um, initiatives will not only be state because civil society provides pluralism of ideas, um, alternative views on, on policy, uh, in, in uh, variants of public policy in this country, but also we are very much expect uh, the exchange of expertise and knowledge with our uh, Europeans. Uh, thank you very much, and we hope that the next task force will be uh, even more fruitful than this one. Thank you very much.
Uh, so thank you, and thank you to colleagues in Brussels, those who have stayed our speakers, uh, to Brad, um, to the EU, um, and those uh, in Kiev who spent a, a great deal with us today. We look forward to our next event, which will be in, in July. And uh, good luck to everyone in Kiev preparing uh, for the upcoming parliamentary elections on July 21st. Um, obviously, Washington, Kia, uh, Washington, Brussels will be watching. And thank you to those who have uh, joined uh, from their desks, from computers, uh, or from things to, to tune into this for across, uh, across Europe, Canada, and the U.S. Thank you so much, and we look forward to seeing you all back again in a couple of weeks. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Uh, and quickly from Brussels, I just also wanted to uh, thank Basil and Jonathan, and thank you very much for the debate. And um, yes, yeah, so we'll look forward to seeing you again for another task force. And yeah, bye from Brussels. Thank you. Thanks. Have a nice day.